Well, good afternoon to all of you. Let me welcome you to CGD and to this event. And let me also take this opportunity to welcome those of you who are joining us uh, uh, through our uh, live uh, webcast and encourage you, if you are going to tweet, to use the hashtag CGD Talks. Today, as part of our uh, series on looking at developments in different parts of the uh, developing world, we're going to focus on, on Latin America. And uh, we have a great uh, panel that is going to take us through what we see as the opportunities, challenges now facing the region. And of course, those of you, as I'm sure most of you, are following the region couldn't think of a more interesting time at which to have this, this conversation. Um, the way we're going to structure it is that uh, Alejandro Werner and Hamid Farouki are going to give us a, an initial presentation. Uh, uh, I'm sure that neither of them needs any introduction, but uh, uh, both Alejandro and Hamid were, of course, colleagues of mine when I was with them in the IMF, where Alejandro leads the work on uh, the uh, region for the IMF, and Hamid is a senior member of uh, his team responsible for the regional outlook, which they have just produced and, and which they will talk about. And then we have uh, Santiago uh, Levy and Liliana Rojasuarez, who are going to provide the initial comments on that presentation. Uh, looking at uh, uh, this, the same kind of picture, but focusing on some of the issues which they think need to be highlighted uh, in that context. And then what I'd like to do is really to open it up and get your participation. Uh, I'm sure many of you have comments and questions that you'd like to raise, so we should be able to get to those quickly. Uh, I beg your indulgence because this, the presentation plus the two comments will take us a little bit of time. But hold your fire, and then we will make sure that uh, we have time for your comments as well. So with that, let me turn it over to Alejandro, and then we'll go from there. Well, yeah, I think we have a presentation. And wow, now we have many presentations. Uh, and I'm pretty sure. We have a clicker somewhere, or somebody will be uh, uh, ch changing the slides. And in the interest of time, let me uh, tell you, I mean, this is a, a summary of what we just presented, I mean, a week ago, of our regional economic outlook, where we have a first chapter in which we discuss the current economic situation and the outlook for the region. Thanks. And then we have three analytical chapters, one of them on monetary policy communication, one of them looking at fiscal multipliers in Latin America, and the last one looking at uh, income distribution and poverty in an environment of lower growth and stronger fiscal challenges for, for, for the region. I'm going to cover the first part. Hamid is going to cover the second part. We'll try to do all of that in 20 minutes. If not, Liliana is going to kill us. So uh, very <laughs> she has been very insistent on keep into our 20 minutes. So, so first, I mean, we're seeing uh, Latin America accelerating from a two-year recession that ended up in 2016. In 2017, uh, Latin America went back to positive growth. In 2018, we're expecting that growth to accelerate. Uh, and therefore, uh, we're seeing a relatively benign, uh, let, let's keep Argentina on the side until, until the Q&A section, uh, but a relatively benign economic environment on the back of a world economy that is growing rel at a relatively healthy pace, uh, some recovery on commodity prices, and a, a recovery of the mostly idiosyncratic recessions that were taking place in South America, in Brazil, and in, in, in Argentina. The downside, downside risks that were seen uh, to this uh, benign environment are many, some of them coming from outside. We highlighted them there, basically the tightening of monetary policy in the advanced, uh, in the advanced economies. Secondly, uh, trade tensions. 
already affecting investment through uncertainty, but uh, with the potential of some intensification of these trade tensions generating uh, more pro problems in, in, in the region. And then we look at domestic risk coming uh, significantly from a, a political side, being 2018 a very heavy electoral calendar in Latin America with around 70% of the population in Latin America going uh, uh, to the polling booth. So in that sense, uh, that, that is already generating important policy uncertainty that is weighing on, uh, on growth. Uh, and, and, and we end, I mean, at the end of the day, our forecast of what potential GDP growth in Latin America has been significantly revised down in the last few years. And therefore, the big challenge for Latin America in the next decade will be how to engineer a relatively sustainable acceleration of potential GDP growth in an environment in which both financial and uh, uh, real economic conditions coming from outside will not be as benign as what we saw, let's say, pre-2014. And, and the biggest challenge, therefore, comes on how to significantly increase investment, productivity in, uh, in this uh, tougher external environment. As I said, we're expecting the world economy to grow at around 4% this year and the next on the back of a U.S. economy that is showing a growth rate of around 3% this year with a very uh, small deceleration next year. This is happening, I mean, uh, uh, basically uh, with a U.S. economy that was already showing a significant acceleration in the last, uh, let's say, six quarters. On top of that, the fiscal impulse associated to the tax reform in, in the U.S. and to the budget that was approved for this year generates a significant aggregate demand push that eventually will lead also to a widening of the current account deficit and to positive effects on growth in the, in, in the short run, increasing some of the medium-term vulnerabilities in the U.S. economy. We're also expecting, I mean, the, the euro area to continue growing at around 2%, and obviously China, we continue to think that they will be able to, to, to manage this transition to a much more balanced uh, growth path without a, a sudden deceleration and maintaining this rate of growth of, of around six and a half. This presents a, a relatively good external environment for, uh, for Latin America. And that's why, I mean, what, what we have is basically, as I, as I told you before, Latin America accelerating from 1.3 uh, last year to 2% this year to 2.8 this year. When you take away Venezuela, that it doesn't represent such a large part of GDP in Latin America, but, but with the high negative rates of growth that that economy is uh, exhibiting, it does affect the average for the region. We're expecting growth to be 2.6 and 3%. In individual countries, I mean, uh, our pre-last week uh, forecast, we had Argentina growing at 2% this year and 3.2 next year. Both Mexico and Brazil going at 2.3 at with some acceleration expected for 2018. Obviously, the, uh, uh, the intensification of financial strains in Argentina in the last couple of weeks are going to alter uh, uh, our macro outlook for the year. And we will come back uh, to, to, to that maybe in the Q&A. But we really, at this point, it's too early to say how does the macro framework is going to, to be affected until we have more clarity on how authorities end up uh, redefining their set of policies after the big shock that they went through. In the, last, uh, in the last three weeks. As I said before, you can see there are the three important factors, external factors that are helping the region. On the, on the one hand, you, you, you have a significant recovery of external, de external demand that show up in an important pickup in real exports. In terms of trade for the region, uh, uh, actually recovering in some cases around two thirds of the drop they had from 2011 to 2016, also generating an important uh, increase in foreign, in foreign income. And financial conditions being relatively good for the region, if we look at them from the point of view of corporate spreads, sovereign spreads, and stock market uh, prices. Although there has been some tightening of financial conditions with a medium-term perspective, they continue to be relatively good. How does uh, the recovery that we're seeing is basically explained by the components of aggregate demand. I would say that in the first stage of the recovery, 2017, basically it was consumption leading the recovery 
in GDP growth. You can see how this uh, uh, purple block here turned from negative to positive in 2017, basically explaining the first leg of the recovery coming from a, a, a resumption of growth in consumption, especially coming from Brazil and a bit from Argentina. As a, a, a stability came back, a, a interest rates came down, the consumer started to, 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 to show a little bit more confidence, a, a, some wage growth, both in Brazil and Argentina, and that got reflected in a positive impulse coming from consumption to, uh, uh, to the recovery. And also investment stopped, stopped falling in 2017, but did not contribute to, to a positive uh, rate of growth. In 2018, the significant change in the shape of the recovery is gonna come from the expected acceleration of investment, and that is going to, to, to help the region accelerate its, uh, its rate of growth. And we're expecting this trend to continue into 20, uh, 2019. From the domestic side, an important source uh, helping the recovery has been the important decline in inflation. You can see on, 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 on this chart, the black lines tell you the highest level that the inflation reached in the past two years in each of these countries, and the red dot shows you the current level of inflation. So as exchange rate came back from their high levels that they reach after the decline in commodity prices and the increase in some domestic public sector prices, inflation came down significantly and this allowed the central banks to reduce interest rates a lot in the last uh, 12 months, significantly supporting aggregate demand. However, on the, other, on the other side, Latin America is basically facing a significant challenge on the fiscal uh, account side as all public finances have deteriorated throughout the region. As you can see, this is the, the blue column show you the deterioration in the primary balance throughout Latin America in the last uh, five years, all the way up to 2016. And then some countries have shown an improvement of that in the, la in the last couple of years, 2017, and that improvement is expected to continue in 2018. But basically, to go back to a debt stabilizing primary balance, these countries still need significant fiscal, uh, fiscal adjustment. Let me very quickly talk about the, the challenges. One is, is tightening of financial conditions in the US. This chart is very interesting because it shows us that even though the Fed has increased the federal funds rate, financial conditions measured by a financial conditions index, looking at a broad set of asset prices have not tightened yet. In every other tightening cycle, you have seen eventually that the Fed intentions translate themselves into some kind of tightening of financial conditions, and that's actually what you want, affecting aggregate demand and reducing uh, uh, aggregate demand pressures and wage pressures. That has not happened yet. When it happens, the countries that we were highlighting here that are more vulnerable to the, to the tightening of financial conditions are those that have higher external financial requirements and also a lower level of international reserves to use as a buffer when they, ha when they face capital inflows. Obviously, Argentina shows up in that chart as a country with relatively high vulnerability to these uh, shocks. Another important uh, potential shock is the increase in protection pro protectionism. We kind of simulated with some of our models what would be the effect on growth on Mexico and Central America of both the US and these countries in Mexico and Central America going to MFN tariffs, and that's a little bit the shape uh, that growth is going to, to, the deviation that growth is going to have from our baseline if this scenario were to materialize for Mexico and Central America. Another important challenge for the region is a corporate tax reform that took place in the US. Basically by the sharp decline in the corporate tax rate in the US back to the OECD uh, average, that will put a challenge both from the corporate base tax uh, shifting uh, from Latin America to the US or potential base shifting that can take place and also eventually some reallocation of firms uh, looking for, for, for places that are more competitive from, from a tax perspective. And I will close just, I mean, highlighting what I said in, in my introductory remarks that in 2018 we have significant political uncertainties with countries with a very low approval rating for the current governments. The red dots there show you the approval rating for each of the uh, governments in Latin America. And with a significant number of elections taking place this year, this cuts 
uh, both ways, both of them, let's say, negative for growth in the sense that on the one hand, you have policy uncertainty weighing on, on investment. And on the other hand, you have lame duck governments in which, I mean, structural reforms will not be implemented throughout 2018 and maybe early months of 2018. So with that, I'll turn it over to Hamid. Thanks, uh, <clears throat> thanks, Alejandro, and thanks, Masood, for inviting us. It's a pleasure, pleasure to be with you. Uh, so what I'll try to do, uh, Alejandro has laid out for you the, the outlook that we have in our regional economic report, uh, a lot of the, the uncertainties and some of the key policy challenges. Let me try to amplify a little bit on some of the policy challenges, and at the same time, I'll elaborate on some of the analysis in our report and, and certainly you know, steer you in that direction to, for the details, but I'll try to give you a flavor of what's in the report and hopefully encourage your appetite to, to, to read it. Uh, you know, Alejandro talked about uh, monetary policy. You saw that you know, policy easing has occurred in lots of countries, uh, central banks in the region. Uh, one of the chapters that we look at, and Alejandro alluded to, was on enhancing monetary policy effectiveness and the role of central bank communication. So the idea of being able to use policy space you first have to create that policy space. Uh, credibility, of course, is, is a key factor in that. And, and as part of enhancing credibility, I'll, I'll talk about the role of, uh, of, of central bank communication uh, in, in that context. Uh, Alejandro also mentioned on this need for fiscal adjustment through much of the region. Um, what the macroeconomic impact of that adjustment will be is, again, one of the topics that uh, we'll elaborate that we have some analysis in this year's report. And then also, uh, on the issue of uh, income inequality and poverty reduction, we've seen gains in the region uh, over the last uh, number of years, last uh, 10, 15 years. The question is going forward in, in a context of weaker medium-term growth prospects, uh, given that commodity prices, although they've rebounded, still remain quite a bit lower than their peak, what will happen with respect to some of the improvements in social indicators going forward? Again, a question that we look at uh, uh, in this year's report. And then finally, uh, I'll come back to this broader issue of, of barriers to long-term growth, uh, some of the concerns that we have when we think about Latin America's long-term uh, growth prospects and uh, with, with respect to, uh, in particular, with respect to productivity. So let me um, talk with, start with monetary policy. Uh, the issue of monetary policy space, as I mentioned, depends very much on how well uh, you know, inflation expectations are anchored. That's often, uh, often described as a measure of credibility. So if you look at the left panel here, what we do is we show you uh, central banks that face a common shock, uh, in, in this case a terms of trade shock similar to what these uh, central banks have faced uh, uh, in uh, 2012, 2014. And for, for, for central banks that have less well-anchored expectations, as you move to the left in that chart, uh, they face the risk that medium-term inflation expectations may drift away from the target. That's what we call these expectations gaps. What happens for those central banks? They'll have to tighten monetary policy. Those same central banks that you see on the left side here are the same ones on the left side of, of the right panel. Uh, so for that same shock, they'll have to often tighten monetary policy to keep inflation expectations anchored. The more credible central banks actually have more room to maneuver. So if you look at, for example, Chile in this particular sample for Latin America, uh, they tend to have one of the, the most well-anchored inflation expectations uh, you know, in, in, in this particular sample of, uh, this is about 20 inflation targeting central banks. Uh, they've actually have the scope to actually ease monetary policy rates in response to a supply shock. And that's partly, again, because of how well inflation expectations are anchored. So that's an important factor when you think about what monetary policy can do going forward. And so the question that we ask ourselves that you should be asking is, what, what's needed to, to have that anchoring of inflation expectations? That's, and that's to, a motivation for what this chapter looks at. Um, one of the things that uh, the chapter kind of identifies is the role of central bank transparency. So uh, we'll, show, we'll show you a couple of uh, scatter plots here that shows that for central banks that have higher transparency, they didn't have greater policy predictability. So here, if you move to the, to the right and to the bottom, you have more transparency and more predictability. And you can see where some of the uh, uh, central banks uh, in Latin America fall on, on, this, on this scatter plot. And interestingly, coming back to the chart that I showed you just uh, a minute ago, those same central banks that are more transparent 
have uh, you know, a better anchoring of inflation expectations in terms of the uh, inflation expectations gap. Part of that, we think, is related to central bank communication. Um, in, in, in the chapter, we'll sh uh, you'll, you'll see some details, um, not just about transparency and how much you communicate, the quantity of information that you provide, but the quality of that information, how you communicate. Um, so on this left panel, this is some interesting analysis that we've done in, 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 the, um, in the Rio this year. We, we do some text analysis of central bank documents, uh, their press releases, their minutes, uh, their inflation reports, and what this left panel shows you is a measure of readability uh, across uh, different central bank uh, documents. Uh, for for Colombia, Chile, Mexico, and Peru, we do it actually in the original Spanish. Brazil is done in English. We, we, we couldn't do the Portuguese, so we kept it on a separate scale. But what you'll see is that there's quite a bit of variation uh, in terms of how much readability these documents have relative to the black diamonds, which is the readability of their, of their uh, local newspapers. Now, to be fair, we, we actually put uh, in here the readability of our own Rio, which is the purple line. So you can see in some cases, we're more or less readable than some of the central bank documents. Uh, none of us can, can quite match the, the readability of Harry Potter, which is uh, you know, the, uh, the, uh, the red dash line. Now, why does, this, why does this matter? Well, if you look at the right panel, th this measure of readability um, that, that we use is also related to, to monetary policy predictability. This is the same measure I showed you on an earlier chart. And this measure is in terms of forecast errors the market makes with respect to the policy rate. So what we do is we, we look at what markets are expecting the day before these policy annou announcements are made, and then we see uh, what kinds of errors are made. So again, if you're down here you know, in, in, to the bottom, to the, uh, Bottom right, you have high readability of your central bank documents and you have high predictability. So there seems to be a connection between you know, the communication of these central banks, uh, not, not just in terms of transparency and the quantity, but also the quality that relates to uh, policy predictability and as I was saying before, it relates to how well inflation expectations uh, may be anchored. Um, let me turn to, to fiscal policy. Again, we have a, se a separate chapter that looks at this issue. Given the policy needs in the region, uh, just to kind of uh, give you some further information, just to uh, uh, complement what Alejandro's already talked about, you can see in the left panel that uh, public debt uh, in much of the region, in Latin America and the Caribbean, has been rising over the last several years in, in an environment of lower growth, lower commodity prices, both because of direct and indirect effects from that. And in our forecast, still rising, although we on current, current projections, we expect it to plateau. But you can see that Latin America and the Caribbean would be reaching debt levels that are quite a bit higher than other emerging markets, which you can see in the, in the uh, red line. And as Alejandro mentioned, there is fiscal adjustment plans that are, that are in the works. The, the, uh, the blue bars here show you the expected change in the primary balance that we have over the next two years, so 2017 through 2019. But notice that for, for several of the economies, they're still going to be well short of the levels that you would need to stabilize debt. So there's still quite a bit of fiscal effort needed to, to reach uh, uh, debt sustainability. You can think of this more as a marathon, not a sprint. We'll need several years of, of sustained fiscal effort to, 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 to get there in, in, in several cases. So the, what we try to do in, in this chapter is look at some of the macroeconomic consequences of of fiscal adjustment and what, what's called a so-called fiscal multiplier. And what was interesting to us is that if you look at the literature, fiscal multipliers for Latin America tend to be rel relatively small. And the question is, do we believe those numbers uh, or not? And what, one of the things the chapter tries to do is come at some, some new methods to, to look at how we estimate multipliers. And when you do that, you actually get a range of estimates uh, that's actually closer to where advanced economies are. So we think that the multiplier impacts can be actually larger. Interestingly, also, the composition of fiscal adjustment tends to matter quite a bit. So whether you're talking about uh, a multiplier for primary expenditure or for, 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 for capital spending by the, by the public sector, the multipliers can look quite different. This tends to be an important issue because the composition of adjustment, the, the choice of fiscal instrument will matter for the multiplier. Uh, and in some cases, those fiscal plans that I showed you earlier actually have a lot of reliance on, on cuts in public investment going, going forward. Uh, let me just say a, quickly a few words on income inequality and poverty reduction. Um, Latin America has actually seen quite a bit of progress in reducing income inequality. I show you the Gini coefficient here. And over the last 
you know, since, uh, since 2000, you've seen a reduction. It's the only region in the world where you've seen a reduction in income inequality. Uh, but still, the bars are very high, so it's still the most unequal region in the world. Um, if you break out the region into individual countries, the, the dots show you that. Um, what's interesting here is that I show you um, uh, the red dots are largely commodity importers and commodity exporters in blue. Uh, both have seen reductions in income inequality. The reductions in poverty tend to be even larger among the uh, commodity exporters. And what the chapter will look at is some of the, some of the channels, the mechanisms why that might be the case. Um, and uh, just to give you the punchline quickly, a large part of the story is uh, because so much of household income comes from labor, about 80%, um, the gains in labor income uh, and employment at the lower end of the wage distribution, the lower end of, for, for low-skilled workers, has been larger, in, particularly in the commodity exporters, and explains a lot of the, the, the income gains uh, and, and the reduction in income inequality, as well as in poverty in these countries, with a smaller role for government transfers, given the size of, of social assistance programs. Um, I think the bigger concern that the chapter raises going forward is will Latin America be able to secure those gains going forward, given that growth prospects are relatively subdued over the medium term? Alejandro showed you the acceleration that we're expecting through 2019. When you look beyond 2019, our forecasts are for growth to largely plateau at those levels. So the issue going forward is that the employment gains that you've seen during the commodity boom which was very high for commodity exporters relative to non-commodity exporters, that's already starting to change now. So if you look at 2015 and 16, the issue is, will we still see the types of improvement in social indicators that we've seen in the past? And, uh, and again, the chapter will have some details on what we think will be a greater onus on policies to continue to secure those gains and, and make progress, further progress on, on those social indicators. So with that, let me, let me leave it there uh, and, uh, and, and turn over to our discussants. Thank you very much. Well, shall we find ourselves a place to sit okay. here? And as I said, what we would like to do now, you've got a lot of information uh, already. And I think it'd be good to now get slightly different perspectives on it. So I'd like to turn to our two uh, discussants. It's entirely up to you, Lilian, as to whether you prefer to do that or okay, yeah. and so. Liliana is going to go uh, first, and then Santiago, and then we will open it up. Okay, uh, thank you very much. Um, that was a great presentation, uh, and that we're really happy having um, you with us today. I want to uh, focus my comments on three issues. Um, the first one is on income convergence. Uh, the Rio make um, a point um, this time about the concerns that the income levels in Latin America may not be converging towards uh, advanced economies. Um, and that, of course, is a concern, but it's not really new at all. Uh, with the exception of very few countries in the region, most notably uh, Chile, uh, basically, convergence only increased or improved in Latin America during the period 2003-2004 to 2012. And that is counting from the 80s. So what I'm trying to say is that in half a century, there were only eight years of convergence for Latin America. Um, now, because this has been a long story, there has been a diagnosis and there has been a recommendation. And for a long time, the diagnosis has always been the same, and the recommendation has always been the same. The diagnosis is the countries lack significant, uh, very low levels of productivity, and need to undertake structural reforms. That is the recommendation. Reforms in education, health, infrastructure, labor markets, which is the missing reform in, in most countries, improvements in government, in governance, et cetera, et cetera. But with the exception of important strides in the monetary, fiscal, and exchange rate policies, as well as price flexibility um, and the trade and finance liberalization, that's it. The countries, the Latin America region, is stuck 
in really moving over into making reform. And the path seems to be always the same. There is a crisis, um, especially like the one in the 80s and the 90s, but there have been others after that. And over and over again, countries allow political circumstances to be in the way of undertaking the reforms that are needed. And this has been happening since the, again, since the crisis periods to now. Even late reformers or late uh, countries that uh, entered this path, like Paraguay, for example. Paraguay uh, became a much more market uh, stabilization economy in the early 2000s. And they entered exactly the same path. Um, uh, big uh, improvements in the, in the macro uh, policy, and not much more. Uh, even right now, uh, in Brazil, the much needed social security reform is not taking place, has been postponed. Why? Because of political considerations. So when we talk about Latin America, it's like, yeah, we have given a, a rise to a certain level of development where we are stuck there. And the most important constraint seems to be political, which means that what the question comes is, what do we need? Another crisis? I really don't think so. I think there is a consensus uh, among the population for certain variables, like low inflation. I mean, that's a big consensus in the region for that. But there is this entrenched um, um, powers and lack of competition that actually are not allowing these reforms to move forward. And so to me, that is an issue that we've been discussing for many years and will come again, over and over again. But this brings me to my second point, which is, of course, Argentina. OK, again, political considerations, and that's why I'm making the linkage here, made the government and the international community, this is important to underline, support a gradual approach to deal with the fiscal problem. The thought was the government, it was a pro-market, pro-growth government. And so, uh, but it won by a very little margin. And um, it really didn't have the political support that was needed to go deep into the reforms that were that involved cutting the deficit significantly. And actually, the government did great in the first hundred days of the of uh, since it uh, took uh, over. A uh, lot of price liberalization, exchange rate uh, flexibility. Um, uh, put together, uh, not only exchange rate flexibility, but remember there was a parallel market there, consolidated uh, exchange rate uh, system now. Um, not only that, but also solved the uh, debt problem, dealing with the holdouts, uh, which allowed Argentina to go to the international capital markets. All good, but the decision to gradually reduce inflation and the deficit largely because of political space <laughs> to move faster implied there was one assumption here, a very important assumption. If you go slower in reducing a, a very important fiscal budget and also reducing inflation slowly, well, the assumption is that you have to finance, increasingly finance the fiscal deficit in the international capital markets. And so they did. And uh, well, um, Argentina is, of course, among the international uh, emerging market uh, countries with the largest external debt. Argentina is among is at the top, with Turkey following, and Turkey is not doing that well either. So, in this environment, expectations of inflation coming down is very hard. You start losing the anchor because you are going slowly in a situation in which you are trying to control expectations on inflation when at the same time exchange rate is going up, but you are not dealing with the main issue of the whole problem, which is the large fiscal deficit. Um, now, Argentina has gone to the IMF, which is absolutely great. Um, uh, it needed, but why did it do it? Because it needed an anchor. They cannot manage expectations right now on their own. 
not if they have these political considerations that don't allow them to do the adjustment that are really needed. And so they need an anchor. Who's going to give the anchor for credibility? It's going to be the IMF with the liquidity support, the IMF, the ITB, the, uh, the World Bank. Everybody is saying, OK, we are supporting the program. But it's because, again, I have to keep underlined that is is because of political considerations in the country. So, so far, we don't know how this story is going to end up, but so far there are two lessons from the Argentine experience. The first is technical. Flexible exchange rates in conditions with very high inflation is very difficult to manage, very difficult. You, it's very hard to keep an anchor in an environment with very, very high inflation. Okay, that's something to look forward. Maybe if Venezuela comes into the round uh, for discussions. And the second is that when you face a choice between the right economic policy and keeping the politician happy, the time has come to show leadership. If you choose to adapt to the political constraint, most likely the economy will go wrong and you will end up losing political support anyway. So what looks like a cash 22, which is what countries in Latin America seems to be thinking over and over again, at the end ends with a disastrous situation. I'm Peruvian, look at my own country, the, the, the president trying to satisfy political considerations out of, of, of power, right? So it, to me, that is another lesson that is coming up from uh, the recent experience. And finally, uh, my third and last point is the dollar appreciation and debt. You know, at the beginning of the year, in this same um, uh, conference room, we had a presentation by the World Bank um, uh, Global Economic Perspectives. And there, we were discussing why the dollar had not appreciated, given that at the time, there was the combination of uh, a tight monetary policy and a loose fiscal policy by the United States that called for um, an appreciation of the exchange rate. But it was not happening at the time. Well, there seemed to be a delaying adjustment of variables, but certainly now that dollar appre uh, appreciation is here. And it's creating problems for highly indebted um, countries. The good news for Latin America is the, that flexible exchange rates actually help a lot in dealing uh, uh, with uh, this type of problems. But there was, since we were speaking at the beginning of the year and now, something happened. And is that because of the perception that interest rates were still keeping low and the dollar was um, not appreciating as much, then there was a new burst of capital inflows to the region. And this time around, governments ran quickly because uh, to get indebted uh, because they knew that the window of opportunity was going to close, close soon. But that, at, at the same time, that attracted a lot of hot money because, again, the markets were, no, they knew that this could, was only going to be a transitory uh, situation. So that gets Latin America at the time, the appreciation of the dollar gets Latin America at a time where, as um, we have just seen in the presentation, there are a lot of financing, financing need, um, large fiscal deficits. So there are a lot of vulnerabilities that the region has have to face. And what worries me the most is that even if Latin America as a region is not weak, like that, you know, it's very, not very weak, is that if we are entering into this process of less capital inflows or le and the dollar, sustained dollar appreciation, there could be a contagion into the emerging market asset class. In the same way that the fact that there was a long period of large capital inflows that made emerging markets, and there was no distinction of who the uh, international capital markets were lending to. I mean, anybody could get a debt, literally. Well, now, questioning of the emerging market asset class as a way to actually move forward for investment could actually be on the table. So 
just to, just to, to finalize, um, I hope that in next time around, when we meet again to discuss prospects for Latin America, we don't come and say exactly the same thing that we are saying right now, right? That the story is like a cycle that keeps repeating itself with big political constraints allowing countries to actually take the leadership needed for moving to the next step of development. Thank you. Thank you very much, Liliana. So now, Liliana said it's all politics. <laughs> um, it's mostly politics. Uh, Santiago, what's your take on all of this? Uh, <laughs> so good afternoon, everybody. Hey, Nancy. Um, <laughs> Uh, let me begin by, by thanking uh, Masood and Liliana for inviting me. It's really a pleasure to be here. And by congratulating Alex and Hamid for, for the latest Rio. Uh, we at the IDB, and I, I'm from the IDB for those who don't know me, are large users of the Rio. And we are indebted to the IMF because we actually, in the distribution of labor, we don't really worry a lot about the short run macro. I think these guys do an excellent job at, at uh, better than what we could do. And I think that their latest regional economic outlook is actually very rich. And it's a report that has been transcending beyond short run macro by incorporating ever more diverse number of issues. Very interestingly, the work on fiscal multipliers is very interesting and very nice. The fact that they have this now chapter on equity and poverty within the Rio is also a very important innovation. And I think it shows a fund and, and a Western Hemisphere department that is evolving very nicely. Um, the numbers, I'll, I'll just make a couple of comments on the macro. And then I'll, work, I'll comment mostly on the section on poverty and equality, because that's what Liliana asked me to, to focus on. But um, just to put the context, the, the numbers that Alex showed at the beginning is kind of the glass is half full and half empty. It is true that relative to the previous year and two years before, uh, the region is doing better. And that, in principle, the prospects for next year are also slightly better than now. But Alex's numbers also showed that relative to the rest of the world, we're doing fairly poorly. So this is a region in which, in the context of fairly benign financial conditions, as Alex showed, is still underperforming vis-a-vis -vis the rest of the world. So it raises sort of deeper questions as to about the structure and, and the constraints of productivity in the region that in this relatively good context with you know, somewhat rebounding commodity prices and all that is still underperforming vis-a-vis -vis the rest of the world. So the question that the Rio that Alex and Hamid put to us, which is, you know, the long-term constraints to growth and productivity and the mechanisms to protect poverty and, and gains on income inequality are actually very much at the center of the table because it has to be done in this context that they're showing us. And it's also very timely because they're doing it in a year in which there are elections in many countries in Latin America, some among the largest, in Brazil, in Colombia, in Chile, with a change of government just recently in Peru. So that brings the question that I want to focus on, which is how in this context can the region protect the gains in income inequality and the gains in poverty? And I guess the starting point is the slides that Hamid was showing us. The slides Hamid shows us are slides that are telling us the fiscal space to continue doing what the region has been doing over the last eight years is not there. The route that the region has followed, not the only one, but an important route that the region has followed to actually lower inequality and to lower poverty, which is through the expansion of a very large number of social programs, sometimes directly focused on the poor, mostly under some kind of variant of a CCT, sometimes focused on the informal sector, as under some kind of variant of a non-contributory pension program or a non-contributory health program, and sometimes broadly, like in Bolivia, as a pension for all. There are very many varieties in the region, but broadly there's been a large expansion of social spending, sometimes targeted, sometimes not targeted. And what Hamid is telling us is this expansion in social spending is actually not a sustainable expansion in social spending. So this raises questions about whether in this context of lackluster growth and more difficult fiscal constraints, more of the same will work. And what I'm trying to suggest to you all is that more of the same will not work. Beyond that, Hamid also showed some very interesting slides about the reduction in inequality. He showed two points. He said, look, 
this is the most unequal region of the world, which is sadly true, but it's been lowering inequality. So that would say, look, at the margin, things are improving. Um, yes and no. Yes and no, because what Hamid also showed is that the reduction in inequality has coming at the, from wage compression. So that the wages of the higher skilled workers relative to the wages of the lower skilled workers, the distance between the two, is getting shorter. From the point of view of just measuring the Gini, that is almost automatically good. It will show you a lower Gini, and you might want to clap. But if you really think about, is this region in which human capital is supposed to be scarce? a region in which we would like to see wage compression between the highest skilled workers and the lower skilled workers. And isn't that telling us something about the labor market in which what we would like to see is the wage premium going up as it's happening in the United States and other countries, not the wage premium coming down. So that the reduction in inequality has two flavors, kind of like cholesterol. There's a good cholesterol and a bad cholesterol. There's a good side to the reduction in inequality and a sort of bad side to the reduction in inequality. And the numbers, if you crank them country by country, vary. And the share of the reduction in income inequality that has come from transfers is higher in some of the countries. And the share that has come from wage compression varies from country to country. Minimum wages have also played a role in some countries. Brazil is an important example. Colombia is another important example. So you've achieved some reduction in income inequality, but you've done it through some mechanisms that might be having an important cost in terms of productivity and in terms of the markets that the, signal, the, the signals that the market should be sending to invest in human capital and the signals that firms should be doing in terms of hiring labor and expanding the labor force and expanding productivity. So it's sort of a mixed picture in the sense that, yes, there have been some advances. Yes, they're welcome. Yes, social welfare is better. But it has come at an, in context of an important fiscal deterioration and this is not going to be able to continue in the future. And in addition, there is some side of the reduction in inequality that might be associated with the reasons why productivity in the region is stagnant, because we're not seeing the demand for skilled labor taking off as we should be expecting, and because we're not seeing hiring in the formal sector taking off in the way that we're sort of hiring. So let me sort of begin to make sort of broader points. As we have elections in the country, in various countries in the region, and as we think forward, the question that Hamid was posing, which is, how are we going to protect the gains in the gains in poverty and the gains in income inequality looking forward? Um, I guess the first point is not by doing more of the same, and then secondly by asking deeper questions as to whether the structure of social programs that we've laid out, which is this cacophony of Contributory and non-contributory health programs, sometimes financed through a wage tax, sometimes financed from the general revenues. Cacophony of pension programs, sometimes a non-contributory pension for everybody. Sometimes a pension that is saved by when you're formal and when you're formal. And then add to that Baker programs and conditional cash transfer programs. Can this mass of incentives be ordered such that in fact you can actually put a structure of social programs that does what you want it to do, protect people from risks and redistribute to those in favor, but at the same time, which is what the region has not been able to do, align incentives of workers and firms in the direction of productivity. These two things the region has not made compatible. The fiscal constraints that Hamid has put on the slides will then show that in the years ahead this will be a major challenge and it will require a lot of rethinking in terms of how we connect social programs with economic policy. Taxing the high productivity sector of the economy and turning around and subsidizing the low productivity sector of the economy is not really the recipe for fast growth. And that in some way is what we currently have on the table. So let me stop there. Thank you. Thank you very much. Santiago, thank you for raising that set of issues. And I guess I'm struck also by what you just said, which is what both you and Liliana sort of made one common point, in, in, which was to say, we've been saying the same thing, and 
we think that more of that isn't going to work. So they, in a way, the future has to be based on a very different set of approaches. So you're saying actually think about a whole new approach to what would be a affordable but efficient welfare system for middle-income countries. And I don't think we have a very good answer to that yet. Um, but you've also both said that the politics is what drives us into the current set of arrangements. And I don't quite see how the future, which requires a very different set of arrangements, will come about with the current politics, which I don't think particularly we're going to change all that easily. So, so I, I, I understand your diagnosis, but I'm kind of wondering how we go from aspirations to to a sort of where this is actually going to make it happen. But, but I will hold that and <laughs> encourage people to, to comment. So I, I think I have Miguel first. I, there should be a microphone uh, available here. There we are, actually. Speak loud. You can speak loud. <laughs> no, no, but it has to be loud enough also for the people who are listening in. And <laughs> I was just saying to, uh, to the colleagues before that now, uh, we actually have often as many or more people listening in on the thing. So, Miguel, um, maybe it'd be great if you could introduce sure. yourself for the others. Yeah, I'm, I'm Miguel Schloss, I'm president of an investment company in Chile. Um, I must confess that I'm a bit puzzled, as puzzled as both of you were, if not more so. And I wonder, and I. I hope I am sufficiently articulate to, to explain my You've concern. Never had is the problem before me. Okay, <laughs> look, uh, whether we are not in the cusp of a, a, a tectonic structural change, in the same way as we had an industrial revolution that moved from agriculture to industry, we are now uh, moving towards a knowledge economy where, uh, where um, automation and, and all kinds of new uh, methods of production will change the whole structure uh, and relative values of labor uh, and of knowledge uh, to a point which we really don't quite know where this is going to lead. My question therefore is, uh, could it be that the metrics that we are using in the IMF and the World Bank uh, by monetizing everything, thinking about monetary policy, fiscal policy, social programs, how to pay for this and for that, isn't something overly aggregate and that really what we need to be concerned about is the underlying changes that countries have to go through, how to overcome the vested interests that uh, is what you call the political constraints, etc., and that unless the region is able to deal with that, and I don't know how the hell, and I don't even know from what you say what the countries need to do, this region will get into major problems because these changes are so fundamental that unless you, re you reach in your analysis to the real sectors, you will not have real answers. That's my broad que my question. Thank you very much. I think that's, uh, and then I have uh, Nancy, and then I'll come to the front. So, uh, so uh, uh, this is a comment a little bit on what Santiago said. I think it's worth reminding ourselves, it's a point that you made, but that this issue of returns rising to low skilled labor is connected to those countries dependent on commodity exports. So to pick up on what Miguel said, um, the question is really that you're raising, Santiago, is how to increase productivity in what we think of as still the informal sector, but probably in services. Uh, this is a big discussion in Africa now, given that manufacturing is not, doesn't look like a future area. So that goes to what Miguel said, you know, some thinking at a less aggregate level about what kinds of even social programs, you know, but it's probably not that. It's, it's something about focusing more in tourism or in agro-industry uh, and thinking a little bit more on the micro side, getting the IMF together with the World Bank and the IDB <laughs> and trying to sort through some of those issues. 
Thank, thank you very much. That's gentlemen. I, I think one of the problems here. Maybe you could introduce yourself just to tell. Excuse me? Just introduce yourself. Peter Hakem, the Inter-American yeah. Dialogue, that I see five economists up there and no uh, political scientists or politicians. <laughs> so of course, the blame immediately goes to the political analysts and the political uh, managers, so to speak. And, the, and my observation is that uh, economic uh, troubles consistently undermine good governance. <laughs> <laughs> that you have uh, so many problems as a result of poor economic management that sort of doesn't, why the uh, sort of, as uh, uh, one of the charts I think that Alejandro had showing the declining, uh, was it yeah. you? Uh, sort of approval ratings were due because the economics is so bad. And I just want to relate that to what Santiago was saying, that maybe just that economists aren't paying enough attention to the questions of poverty and inequality. I mean, the Washington consensus, the beginning of the 90s, where you start from, uh, was precisely absent any attention at all to social issues. And so in some ways, and, and, you know, and economic predictions haven't been the greatest either in terms of predicting sharp changes in global uh, events or in national events. So the, the question is, what's the problem with economics, not with politics? <laughs> okay, thank you very much, Peter. So why don't we take one more, and then I'll come around to the first round, and then we'll take another round. And, and I'll come back to you in a moment, Nancy, but let me take the person in the back first, and then. Thank you. I'm Rafael Matos from uh, La Nación, from Argentina. I just have a question for um, Alejandro. President Macri just said that uh, Argentina has to accelerate its fiscal adjustments. And the Minister of uh, Hacienda, Nicolás Duhovne, recently announced that they're going to lower uh, the fiscal target to 2.7% of GDP this year. I know you're in talks with the Argentine government, but I was very curious about how do you feel about this new goal of 2.7% of, of GDP, if you think that uh, acceleration is enough already. Well, I thank you for that question. It took five questions to get to Argentina, which was, I was expecting <laughs> to be earlier in this, but, but uh, it just shows how compelling the other issues are. So let me come back first. I'll, I'll come back to you, Nancy, in, 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 but uh, is it on the same same point? Okay, then, then let's, let's get Nancy's uh, question it as well, and then we will do the well, second. I, I wanted to say also, I think this point about um, how could Latin America become more depend more of a consumption-based economy is related to the problem of inequality. And there was a lot of discussion in the U.S. at the time of the financial crisis that the was a problem of inequality that led to uh, the subprime mortgages and all that. And so it does go back a little bit to maybe Peter's point is there, do we have enough grip on what have been the fundamental causes of this long history of inequality? Well, we know, we know, but what, what are other ways to address it besides social programs? I think that's what you're saying, Santiago. All right, good. So, <clears throat> why don't we go in order? <laughs> Left, left right. Right. Yes, I think, so, 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 so. Okay. I think, you know, with, with Alejandro here, I mean, the basic rule is going to be that he's going to pass the most difficult question. <laughs> okay. Uh, okay, let me... And let he'll me do Argentina. Right, <laughs> so I, I'm going to leave that one for him. Um, let me maybe uh, give a couple reactions, maybe also to, to Santiago. Thank you for your uh, helpful uh, comments and also uh, from the audience. Um, you know, on the issue of inequality, let me come back to, to, to that particular point. Uh, you know, you're certainly right that part of what, part of the implication of what I showed was that there was this kind of compression in the skills premium. I, I wouldn't necessarily, you know, uh, I, I would give a little more nuance to maybe to, to that particular particular point. When you compare the experience of the commodity exporters to the importers um, in, in the sample that I showed you, both of them had the same compression. But one group had that with wage growth across all the categories, 
and, and, and the importer side actually didn't have that. So, so you can get the wage compression in different ways, and, and I think that's an important distinction. I, I think it was a comment from, uh, from the audience that this was in response to a commodity price shock, and, and that's how the, why the shock played out a bit differently across, across the, 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 two, the two groups of countries, broadly speaking. Um, I mean, you're certainly right that the fiscal space is limited. We, we take that point, and then you know, the fiscal charts, I think, sh show that. From, from our perspective, prioritization of, of fiscal spending is going to be very, very important going forward. But the other implication of the analysis that we've done is that you know, what we've seen so far in terms of the, the, gain, the, the gains in the social indicators have come largely through market forces that, that the changes in labor income, less through redistribution and transfers in, in Latin America. And maybe that mix will have to change going forward if we want to see continued progress given that commodity prices may, may, not, uh, may not move uh, may move broadly sideways from from here. So I, I would just make that distinction, you know, in, in terms of that. But, but I think the broader point, coming back to the, the deeper question about longer term growth, the knowledge economy and so forth, there let me just give you one quick reaction, which is that Latin America tends to invest too little in itself. Uh, when you look at, I, I didn't have that chart today, but we have it in our slide deck. But if you look at investment levels in Latin America, Alejandro showed you a cyclical rebound, which is, which is underway. But if you look at longer term averages, we, we don't invest as a region as much as, say, other emerging markets. Uh, and I think that's a big part of the question, I think, in terms of where, where these economies will go in terms of their dynamism, their structural changes that, 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 that are required. Without the investment, it's hard to see how you get there. And so I think that's something that we need to take a closer look at. Um, maybe just one other quick reaction to um, Liliana's comments on having seen this movie again and again. Uh, we know what the ending looks like. There, let me give you a slightly more positive uh, spin to it. I think there, there are some changes that I think make the movie a little bit different this time around. Um, Argentina aside, I think when you look at central banking in general, I think we've seen improvements uh, over the last 20 years in the institutional frameworks. Um, and, and so part of the challenge will be to, to leverage that, to take that forward, to continue to enhance that credibility, uh, to, let, to set the necessary conditions for growth on the, on the macro stability side. And, and I think that, uh, you know, as you said, I mean, uh, you, you have this issue of exchange rate flexibility and high inflation. For some of these countries that we've seen through the recent period, they did allow their exchange rates to move quite a bit. They had a lot of exchange rate depreciation over the last few years, right, in the wake of uh, lower commodity prices. What we've noticed is that exchange rate passed through. How much of that exchange rate showed up in inflation did decline over time. We think that that was partly uh, an attri you know, attributed to improved policy frameworks for these economies. We, we take that as a positive sign, something to build on going forward just to give up maybe a little bit more of a positive spin and maybe that the movie the movie has changed slightly from from the past okay so let me see what what was i mean our title was seizing the momentum and this is getting <laughs> super depressing so i think that <laughs> and, 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 and a bit of that maybe has to do with the closeness of i mean events in in, in argentina in in the last two weeks I think uh, that is biasing a little bit this discussion. I think a lot of the medium term issues uh, are there, are big challenges. But I think as Hamid was saying, I mean, we have to look, Latin America went through a, a huge terms of trade shock. And in many economies, that, trace of, of, that terms of trade shock had significantly lower impact on growth, on unemployment. And eventually when we have the numbers uh, on poverty than what similar shocks would have had in the past. And that has to do with a, a floating exchange rate, central bank independence, public finances, a conditional cash transfers, a lot of issues, policy uh, frameworks that were put in place in relatively contested and active democracies. So I think in, 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 in a continent that has moved from a, a continent where, where we saw widespread uh, dictatorships, a continent that has the highest income inequality in the world, a continent in which there's a lack of legitimacy of the system because we have this uh, very high inequality, high poverty, and we have a, a significant concentration of economic power in key sectors, I think the accomplishments are not minor, but also the challenges are, are, are very, very large. And I think 
Sometimes, uh, uh, I think Liliana was right on the point of highlighting politics, uh, and we did not mention them. Uh, but I think sometimes in, in, in a forum such as this, we talk about politics and we kind of dismiss it as something that it's self-motivated. But these difficult politics reflect all of these social complexities in the country that make extremely hard in a democracy to change policies. And in that sense, I think what we have seen in Latin America is not minor, but the challenges are very large. But, but uh, so, so and, and, and now the, the, the region is set to accelerate uh, to a lower steady state because the external environment will be uh, much more challenging. And, and I think that's a little bit the, 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 uh, the context. I think we, we, there's a lot of scope, even with, with this lower medium term growth, to, to, to be able to continue increasing social indicators at, at a lower pace. I think when you look at the budgets, there is fiscal consolidation to be done, but the degrees of inefficiency in public expenditure are very, very large. And I think after a decade of significant increases in public sector expenditure in Latin America, there's a lot of scopes to focus on, on, on efficiency and get some important gains uh, there. So, 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 so I think there, there, there are bright spots uh, uh, there, and I think the situation will force government uh, to look uh, to to, to look at those. I think the point uh, uh, that Miguel was, uh, was making, I think, I mean, it's extremely also preoccupying in the sense that, I mean, given the speed at which society is able to tackle issues, uh, uh, the discussion in Latin America sometimes, uh, we keep on discussing how to solve so problems of the past, and we don't have a place in our agenda to look at the future and really be preparing for those shocks. I think, uh, when we have our spring meetings and our annual meetings, authorities come, we talk about fiscal policy, monetary policy, and that is the urgent things that they need to do now, but there's no <coughs> place in which the region is discussing how, how, how to accommodate, how to make way for, for the shocks that are coming from artificial intelligence, from rot robotization, from all the things that are happening in the rest of the world. And, and, and it seems that we're talking of things of the last two, 20 years and not the next 20 years. And, and, and the region, therefore, will not be prepared. And then you go to Asia and you think, see how other societies are, are preparing for those things. And I think that's, a, 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 I mean, extremely concerning. And then I, I will just, a, a, I mean, continue with the observation that, that Masood made that maybe it took five questions to reach to Argentina because we have a public that has rational expectations, and they knew the fund was not going to answer that. <laughs> oh, so you have an explanation of why it took five questions. That's very good, yes. Santiago. So, so my take on Peter's question, and then I'll, I'll, I'll comment to Nancy. Broadly, I, 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 I agree with Alex that on the macro side, the region has improved substantially. That if you compare the picture now with two decades ago, independent central bank, much more awareness about the importance of having sensible exchange rate regimes. Many countries with fiscal you know, responsibility loss of some sorts. In general, much less budget deficits than in the past. So yes, you know that Venezuela, but on the whole, I don't think the problems in the region are with the macro. I think the macro over the last two decades has really improved vastly and accounts for some of the stuff that we've seen. I think, and let me now speak for myself, I think where we don't really understand what is going on, or at least I don't fully understand what is going on, is on the micro. We don't understand really why productivity has stagnated so much. So take Mexico. There's a free trade agreement with the largest economy in the world. It has stabilized the economy. It has invested in human capital. It has raised the investment rate. It has done a huge amount, number of things, all very laudable, all very difficult. But productivity growth in Mexico over the last two decades is zero. Zero. Why? 
why at the micro level, you know, Mexican entrepreneurs are not dumb. Mexican workers are not dumb. They're more educated than before. And they have a stable macro environment. They have an open trade regime. They have stability, certainty, all this stuff. So when you say it's the economist's fault, which are putting the, you know, the politicians in problems and all that, partly, partly. I think the economists have done a good job on the macro. I think, this is my own take, we have not done a very good job on the micro and understanding the real issues. I've, my remarks were mostly on thinking through the incentives that very well-intentioned social programs can unfortunately sometimes have on microeconomic behavior in ways that are undesirable. And we understand that partly. And so that brings me to Nancy's question. Um, I, I think that neither for Latin America, probably even less for Africa, although I know very little about Africa, we can think about a manufacturing-led growth, Asia style. You know, the, in, in manufacturing in Mexico, employs less than 15% of the labor force. So no matter how big the productivity gains that you're going to get there, is not going to be able to pull the rest. So because we don't understand really well why productivity is stagnating, it's then very difficult to come back and say, well, this is what you should do. Um, my own sense is that you want to be as neutral as you can vis-a-vis -vis sector composition. And you want to delink as much as possible social transfers from the status of firms and workers. The big mistake, in my view, in the region is that transfers, whether it's for social insurance in particular, for health, for pensions, for disability, for all this stuff, are associated with whether you're formal or you're informal. This division is lethal. And this division is endogenous to the way you structure your programs. If you transit it to universal programs, you still want the transfers, of course, and you still want the redistribution. But you want to do it in a way that all these microeconomic incentives to firms and to workers are not messed up very badly. It's endo it's, which is endogenous, too. It is not because people are, are not educated. It is endogenous to all these incentives that are there. And let me move a little bit between from social stuff to sometimes that we, we have these small tax regimes for firms, right? So you say, well, small firms are important. They create jobs. We should favor them with a small tax, with a favorable tax regime. And then as we've been studying these regimes more and more, we understand that they're probably very perverse because the marginal tax on firms for growing is huge. And it actually doesn't make sense for many firms to grow. And you begin to understand why in Peru, 90 some percent of the firms have two, three workers and they don't want to grow because the tax regime says, and these are very well-intentioned small regimes for more <coughs> firms. So all these micro stuff we haven't worked as well and understood as well. What Alex was saying earlier is, you know, central banks, independent central banks, open trade regimes, better flexible exchange rate management. We can improve on monetary communication. We can improve on all this stuff. But by and large, that's not where the ballgame is. The ballgame is, and economists haven't done their homework as much as they should have done in all these micro incentives. Sorry for taking so long. Thank you very much, Tatiana. Yeah, um, of course, I fully agree. <laughs> <laughs> Of course, I fully agree um, on the much better macro. And actually, that's what I've been saying in my presentation, that is the macro, but only the macro, that, uh, that improved. But even there, there are things that uh, need adjustment. For example, when we say that there has been very small pass-through, how in the world are you going to have pass-through when you start with very low levels of inflation and the world with zero inflation. It's a very different way of a channel of communication, of transmission of inflation, when you actually are living in a world of inflation. There was no inflation in the world. Actually, countries, including in Asia, were in a disinflation uh, process. And so, you know, the pass-through can change anytime. That is not something that I would be um, committed to. Uh, just because of the last period of a low and disinflation period in the world. Uh, and Latin America depends so much in the, uh, on what's happening in the world because of the commodity export, but perhaps even most importantly, because it's such low savings ratio that implies that it's so dependent on external finance. 
So that dependence is what creates or what has uh, um, led to a low level of equilibrium by solving the macro. Let me explain that. So you get into a situation where you are avoiding one side bets, which means you're not going to attack the, the, the exchange rate very often. You are not going to have huge banking crisis. Um, you are not to have, uh, going to have huge defaults um, in, in history. But at the, when I said at a low level of equilibrium, implies that the proportion of the societies that involve in that equilibrium at a good macro is very small. Think about just in terms of numbers, with the exception of Chile. Um, look at the financial systems. What percentage of the population is actually attached to the formal financial system? Incredibly low. The financial system works very well, very well, very stable, with a very small size of the population. So they are very happy on, OK, um, I, will have, I will be stable, follow all my international requirements for financial stability, but will lend to a very selected people at low interest rates. Why? Because they are low risk too, right? So I can keep the low interest rates, relatively speaking, because the spreads are huge still. But it's a low level equilibrium because I'm not including everybody into, into a society. And that brings to the issue of informality that you mentioned, Santiago. Uh, which is extremely related uh, because how are you going to have reforms that are the ones that we actually need, which are the Congress reforms, judicial reforms, those reforms that actually are the ones that change the will of uh, making a different path of long-term growth and improved productivity. If you have a large amount of the population that is not even interested in participating because they would have to pay taxes otherwise, and why would they be paying taxes if they're not going to be benefiting from the offering of public goods that the rest of the, of the, the small part of the population enjoys so much? So in reality, it's a combination of the politics and the economics. But yes, I agree that the incentives are there, and there is much to do, and there are a lot of things that are low-hanging fruits. And you just mentioned one when you, you talk about the digitalization. So much effectiveness of government provision of services can be achieved by just using the new technologies that are um, uh, now in place. Will governments take the opportunity to actually do that? I don't know. That's a question mark. But it's a low-hanging fruit. It's there. It's very cheap. It costs almost nothing, and it needs very little political will to implement. So to me, that is the first line of action, the use of the new digitalization. Thank you. Now, let's, we think we still have time for maybe a couple of questions. So the gentleman over there, maybe that's it. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, Sebastian Strauss, Brookings. A um, couple of uh, comments. One on the uh, link between economics and, uh, and politics that Liliana, you were mentioning uh, earlier. I mean, if you want to sever that link between economic cycles and political cycles and solve that principal agent problem that's, you know, it happens everywhere in the world. That requires institutional reforms. Uh, it's not political reforms, it's not economic reforms, that requires institutional reforms. And you can't have institutional reforms in polarized societies like we have in Latin America. So personally, I don't see a uh, quick fix for that. I don't know if uh, any of the panelists have uh, uh, any ideas? Um, moving on to uh, Argentina, <laughs> elephant in the room. Um, I'm always uh, uh, stunned. Uh, I think uh, we Argentines uh, uh, are sometimes uh, more afraid of floating than we are of sinking. Uh, and uh, <laughs> uh, I think one of the big mistakes that the the uh, current economic authorities in Argentina. Uh, uh, have made was uh, not float with enough conviction. Uh, when you start, when, when you switch to an inflation targeting regime from such a high uh, initial inflation rate and use uh, uh, interest rates as your, uh, as your instrument uh, in a, uh, uh, a country with uh, open capital accounts, I mean, you're walking the tightrope of the, uh, of the trilemma. Uh, and you, know, you, you, you can fall in one of the two uh, uh, equilibria 
uh, borrowing from uh, Cole and Kehoe, and they just happened to fall in the bad equilibrium uh, last week. So uh, are we out of the crisis zone? Okay, I take that as a comment. Uh, <laughs> so, I, uh, <laughs> uh, maybe one last question over there. Yeah, thank you. And then, or comment. Uh, thank you. My name is Paul Beckerman. Uh, used to work at the World Bank and uh, am now a macroeconomic consultant, as it happened. Uh, I, I just want to ask a general question and, and try to, I, I'm curious to how you, how do you respond. What is the role of government investment going forward in Latin America? Is, should we be focusing on reducing it to stabilize and opening a place for the private sector, if possible? Or uh, is this what's missing in establishing productivity growth? Thank you. All right, so recognize in time, I will, if people want to pick up, so maybe Alejandro. So. I think, I, I mean, I think the last one, I, I, I think public sector investment should play a much larger role. I think there's a huge gap. And part of that is, has to come through PPPs, et cetera. But part of that has to be budgetary expenditure. At the end of the day, it's a, a, it's a social return. It's investment that has a social return, not a private return. And we, and we get no, no, no. I, I, I know that's a, well. You you need public sector expenditure efficiency reform to to, to shift the budget towards a, a profitable investment. I mean, you have a lot. I mean, when you look at a, a, the the effects of, of on income distribution of uh, public uh, sector policy, both tax and expenditure in Latin America, we don't get a lot of progressivity out of our public sector. A lot of that is telling you that we have a significant amount of public sector expenditure that it's not generating efficiency, not generating a, a social returns, and it's not generating redistribution. So I, I, I think there's a lot to do there. Obviously, in an environment in which your income is falling, it's much tougher. And I think a, a moving towards a, a public-private partnership, there's an important role, but we should not oversell that role because a lot of the expenditure that needs to be done, it's in, in projects that will not generate a significant uh, private rate of return, it's a social rate of return. So I think, and, and on floating exchange rate, I think, I mean, the, the, it, 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 it is true, uh, uh, you will never have the optimal regime, but looking at the last 20 years in Latin America, I, I think floating exchange rates uh, have really served Latin America quite well. And it's worth to, to walk that line eventually towards, a, a, yeah, our, and, and, and Argentina had a very difficult situation to begin with, with no reserves, a, a high inflation that was not measured. So coming out of that was, was very hard. And the transition, we tend to forget what Mexico went through after 94, what Chile went through after a, a, the transition to inflation targeting, and also Colombia. The, this history is 20 years back, but we went through the same. I was looking at the things we ended up doing at Banco de Mexico in 98, et cetera. We had significant scares, capital market scares, uh, when the Asian crisis happened, when Russia happened. And, and there was a lot of volatility there. There was a lot of lack of credibility in the system because the system was getting instituted. And it's a very different environment today. No? And, and when, when, when that's a little bit uh, what we see when we look at the history of, of how this thing was implemented in Latin America. And now I think it's paying a, a lot of results for those countries. Thank you very much. So conscious of the time, and Santiago, is there anything? So uh, Liliana, you? If you don't have time. Oh, yeah, I think we're so given we are, did you have something you want? I have one comment. Yeah. Please. Yeah, is in regard of your uh, comment about how to make reforms in polarized economies. Um, uh, yes, that is very difficult. It's not impossible. We actually have a book here called Growing Pains in Latin America that actually goes into details of what you can do. But I want to give you an example of how you can actually... Costa Rica, very small country, was not was a very uh, was an economy that moved on consensus, and there had two parties. This is kind of essential too. 
most countries that are successful have two parties, not 20 parties, two parties. And um, when they did the reforms of the 90s, they privatized the education system. But the problem was that the professors, the teachers, were very good and were, were kind of felt part of the society and at a high level and very productive. When they were actually, when the public sector was privatized and education became private, uh, this little group of people formed a third party. And that third party was strong enough to block every reform that was put into Congress. You all must have heard of CAFTA, the Central America Free Trade Agreement. You know, that almost did not happen because of Costa Rica. That little party blocked absolutely every reform and was against CAFTA. It found a solution. So solutions can be found. How? Well, a referendum was called for, and they won. Well, examples like that exist in multiple cases. But what I'm saying is that clearly, without giving the franchise to the population, there is no way you can move ahead. Yeah. Thank you. So I want to kind of bring this to a close. I just want to end with one simple observation, which is we've been talking about Latin America. But I remember in the same room, we had conversations earlier in the year about Africa. We had conversations about South Asia, conversations about Middle East. And the interesting thing is that in every single one of those conversations, the conclusion was that we've kind of got our hands around the macro. And the macro broadly is a lot better than it used to be. Right. But that we really haven't quite figured out how to get the underlying economy to work better, to even meet the challenges of today. And then the second refrain, which was common, was sort of Miguel's point, which is, and none of us really feel prepared to deal with the disruptive technologies that are going to completely, could possibly completely change the way in which we work, we relate to enterprise, to society, to each other. And we all feel a little bit at sea on that. So I think it's a, it's a small solace to feel that we're not alone <laughs> in, in facing these problems. But at least, you know, we, we shouldn't feel that, you know, that in America is kind of unique in, in not having got its grips around it. Doesn't mean that those issues are any easier to address. And, and if I can end with a little bit of kind of CGD promotion on this, which is to say that one of the reasons we are now, uh, we've just set up a working group to look precisely at the impact of disruptive technologies on the nature of work and the model for development because I think it does raise questions about if it's not going to be manufacturing, what will it be? Uh, and we will be happy to, to report on that. My colleague Charles Kenny is, uh, is leading that work, and, and we will report on that in due course. So we will share whatever you all can bring to the table in that context. So let me take this opportunity to, to thank uh, our panelists, first of all, uh, Alejandro and Hamid for this excellent uh, framing uh, presentation and then Santiago and Liliana for their uh, wonderful uh, comments. Uh, and thank you all for coming. Thanks. Thanks so much. So